you have a lot to cover. Um, okay, hello and welcome to the OFA's Farm Safety and Rail Crossings webinar. My name is Heather Dirks and I am OFA's Farm Policy Analyst who covers land use, farm property and rail crossings. We have a very informative presentation for you today and I am very excited to get started. But first, there are a couple of housekeeping items that I'd like to go through with you just quickly before we start. First, please be advised that the meeting is being recorded. Secondly, we are going to have the opportunity for a brief Q&A with our presenter at the end. You will notice that you have been muted by the host. I will ask that you remain muted. And if you do have any questions, please type them into the chat. I will be monitoring the chat and I will moderate the Q&A discussion at the end. If there are additional discussions, questions that we don't get time to go into, I will be compiling those into a list to share with our presenter afterwards. And we will hopefully be able to get those answered after the meeting. But I don't think there are gonna be any questions left unanswered because this is a great presentation. We have a very knowledgeable presenter for you who I'm going to introduce in just a moment. And just a reminder that we do have a lot of ground to cover this hour. And again, if you could please stay muted and save your questions till the end and type anything into the chat that hasn't been answered, that would be great. So without further ado, please allow me to introduce our presenter. We're very lucky to have with us today, Lillian Lee of Pardon Consulting. Lillian has been in the railway industry for more than 10 years. She began her career working for Canadian Pacific Railway, where she managed third-party grade crossing and bridge projects. She then continued on to work with Transport Canada as a railway works engineer during the rollout of the grade crossing regulations. She now consults for railways, road authorities, and contractors on railway safety. Lillian has inspected over 1,000 crossings in Ontario and Quebec for safety compliance and whistle cessation. She is fluent in the legal requirements at grade crossings and their practical applications in the field. And she is eager to share her knowledge with all crossing stakeholders as she believes awareness is the key to improving rail and public safety. With that, welcome Lillian to the virtual OFA stage and thank you so much for joining us today. We will get started and I will turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Heather, and thank you again for allowing um, me to come and speak with your membership. It's definitely one of our mandates to bridge the knowledge gap uh, with all crossing stakeholders. So uh, let's get into it. Um, this presentation is specifically about farm and private crossings and just a little bit of an agenda. So um, at first, we'll just start off with the goals. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the legal authorities. We're going to also do something quite important, which is define the difference between a farm and private crossing. Uh, they, are, they can be two different things and we'll get into that. Um, we'll talk about maintenance responsibilities, uh, both legal and also just safety best practices for um, agricultural crossing owners to consider. Um, we'll also talk about rail developments and crossing changes as there's a lot happening in Ontario um, with the um, you know, passenger rail development that uh, might be encroaching on uh, agricultural lands. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about maybe how to uh, address um, some of those um, matters. And then we'll also talk about grant funding that's available uh, to agricultural um, crossing owners um, if they're looking to do safety improvements or even crossing closures, uh, there are there is a grant funding program by um, provided by Transport Canada that um, you can apply for, and we'll get into that too. And then at the end of the presentation, there's a whole list of links of where most of this information came from that um, you can all reference um, in the future as well. So let's get into the goal of this presentation is to educate farm and private crossing owners on railway safety and their responsibilities. By the end of this presentation, you should understand who the legal authorities are when it comes to farm and private crossings, what defines a farm crossing and a private crossing, what the typical responsibilities are and best practices, um, how to address rail developments, how to access grant funding. We kind of talked about that in the intro, so that was just kind of um, a repeat there, sorry. Okay, and then the Railway Safety Legal Authority. So very, um, I guess, 
the basic foundation of railway crossings when it comes to farm and private crossings is that it's the Canadian Transportation Agency that sets the foundation. So they're a third party tribunal that um, the Canadian Transportation Act um, was developed by. So it's not just for rail, it's also for marine air. So they have specific regulations for each of the different transportation and goods movement in Canada. Um, but you can see a couple items there as well that's particularly to rail that they can support crossing stakeholders with. And that those are things like crossing ownership and maintenance costs and rates. Um, drainage requirements. I know, Heather, we sort of talked a little bit about how some of the agricultural uh, property owners might be having some conflicts or issues with drainage uh, in proximity to the railway. We're going to get into a little bit of that um, in the presentation. Um, also, noise and vibration complaints for people that live close to the rail, um, formal disputes um, resolution, um, and, and if there's a formal dispute, their CTA will grant a decision. Um, these are decisions that the railways and kind of the industry then reference as precedents. I guess that's a thing in Canada is a sort of precedents in law. So these decisions can be used for similar cases. Um, and the CTA always references stakeholders to refer to old cases to give an idea of how their particular situation might um, kind of pan out. And then another thing that the CTA offers, which I don't think uh, many stakeholders um, take advantage of, which they should, is that they do provide informal facilitation and mediation on issues. So for example, if you're an agricultural land or crossing owner or even landowner and you're having issues with the railway um, in terms of drainage or any of these you know, ownership and or maintenance rates, um, you can contact the CTH and they can facilitate like an informal mediation between you um, yourselves and the railway. And um, through that, it can hopefully progress things. You know, there is always that um, sort of stigma that the railway is super busy and they're really hard to get a hold of and you might not be getting responses. If you feel that that's the case for you, um, reach out to the CTA. We have some links in the reference and you can also, we'll provide it after a contact for you to get back to. I, I email them all the time with questions and they're actually very responsive. So it's definitely something to take advantage of um, if you are if you are kind of at a, um, a, a, have a special case that you need some, some help with. Um, another very important regulating authority is Transport Canada. So whereas you have the CTA that defines um, sort of crossings and ownership and, and things like that. You have Transport Canada's Rail Safety Division that enforces the Railway Safety Act and all the standards and legislation. And they do that through um, field inspections. Um, and again, they're really um, responsible for federally regulated railways. Um, which are the CNCP via, there's, a, there's quite a few that are listed on their website, um, but they do also have special agreements for oversight for non-federally regulated railways, and there are a few listed there. Um, now, does it really matter for us as, or like in this presentation, the difference between federal and non non-federal? Not too much, but it's just to give you that their purview is really for the class one kind of federal um, Railways, the enforcement activities can still be the same. So you might see potentially a railway safety inspector out with the railway doing inspections um, at your crossing. Um, that's definitely not uh, something that is unseen. Um, and then it's Transport Canada that uh, was able to develop the the official grade crossing regulations and standards, which many of you may have heard of. I know the OFAs has issued some um, articles about these regulations and standards coming out. Um, so this it's come it comes from Transport Canada's body as the regulating agent. And then you might also hear about the Transportation Safety Board. So they are an independent agency that was created through an act of parliament and they're responsible for incident investigations of any type of railway related accident. Um, they also do publish statistics on their website on accidents at grade crossings. And you can even see in this pie chart, sorry, it's really small, but there's a small sliver there for farm crossings. So 
there is a, sort of a oversight or involvement uh, for agricultural crossings um, through, through their work as well. Okay, so we can get right into what are the definitions of a farm and private crossing. Um, and the first thing, even before we get into it, is that there is a common misconception that all farm crossings are private crossings. Um, so it's interest, It's important to note that those terms are not always interchangeable as it depends on the crossing's initial inception, um, agreements potentially that are at a crossing, uh, board orders or other ownership documents that can dictate whether your crossing is a, is, is a farm crossing or a private crossing. Um, and it's important to note that those grade crossing regulations um, standards from Transport Canada, they apply formally to public and private crossings. So although farm crossings are not officially covered by the regulations, it is still best practice for crossing farm crossing owners to relate to the pro to the grade crossing regulations and standards as best practices for safety. And we'll get a bit more into that when we get to the responsibilities. Okay, so the definition of a farm crossing. So back to the CTA, the ones that sort of do the foundation. Um, a farm crossing, which is also defined as a section 102 crossing in this in the Canadian Transportation Act, um, is what would define a farm crossing. And there, this is the kind of taken from the act, which says, if an owner's land is divided as a result of the construction of a railway line, um, the railway company at the owner's request must construct a suitable crossing for the owner's enjoyment of the land. So um, when you have a farm crossing, it means the landowner, as a landowner, you have a statutory right to the crossing. Typically it's at the railway's expense. Generally, there's no, no formal agreement because the railway has come through your lines and or come through your property and with their railway line. So there's no formal agreement. It's up to the railway to provide you with that crossing. Um, and it's it can typically usually when we talk about farm crossings that they are seasonal use. Um, and again, um, it, oh yeah, okay. So there, it's also not for public use or access. So a farm crossing should be typically for the agricultural land owner uh, and no access from the public. Um, if public can access it, so this is an example, maybe a pick your own farm kind of business where um, the public starts using your crossing, um, you're starting to get into gray areas where it could be considered a public crossing and there may be um, enforcement activities that occur because it's now open to the public and now it may have to be brought up to the public um, kind of standards in the, in the regulations. But it's also important to know, which I say in all presentations, that every crossing is a snowflake and there are many different conditions that can affect how a crossing is looked at in terms of safety. So um, this is just something to think about. But if you do have a farm crossing and the public can access it, you are sort of opening up a sort of gray area. Um, and it's maybe a good idea to start looking at the regulations and standards and how it could apply to your crossing. So what doesn't make a farm crossing? There's a couple conditions where the, the definition of farm crossing would not apply. So if your lands were severed before 1888 by the railway, uh, so that was before like the big confederation build of the Cross Canada Railway, then uh, we couldn't say that it's uh, a farm crossing. Um, if a person doesn't own those two parcels of lands that were separated by uh, the railway line, then um, it would not be defined as a farm crossing. And also similarly, if the title is severed into two separate parcels, um, then it, you wouldn't have a right to that sort of farm crossing as defined. And again, just to repeat that farm crossings are not formally included in the grade crossing regulations and standards. And what that just means is that if a Transport Canada enforcement officer or inspector came out in to see your crossing, um, you wouldn't be subject to the fines that are potentially there. However, they can, their sort of tool for enforcement is a letter of concern where you will 
still see their concerns for safety. Uh, therefore, sorry, there's a typo I just noticed. Uh, the best practices uh, for the regulation standards should still be applied, um, even though it's not formally part of the regulations and standards. So that was farm crossings. And now um, there's the definition for a private crossing, which in the Canadian Transportation Act is known as a section 103 crossing. So in this case, the agency may order a railway to construct a suitable crossing if they deem it necessary for the owner's enjoyment of the land. So we love law. It's very like, not like very, that's kind of like open, not so uh, specific, but um, um, just some things to note that if it is a private crossing, at, unlike a farm crossing where it was a statutory right, here, a private crossing is not a right by the landowner. It's discretionary decision by the CTA or order by the CTA. Um, therefore, some of these crossings can involve cost construction and maintenance costs by the landowner. Um, and typically, private crossings do have a construction from when it was initially built and also an ongoing maintenance agreement. So if you do have an agricultural crossing and you do know of an agreement, that you have with the railway that maybe says, you know, you split the maintenance 50-50, most likely you have a private crossing on your hands. And typically private crossings are for use by three or less um, private dwellings. Um, they can also be, their private crossing can also be used by um, like industries companies, maybe it's a quarry, um, and so the whole, the whole company is using that crossing. That can be a private crossing under agreement with the railway. Um, also associations or groups. So there are some seasonal, you know, ATV, snowmobile clubs, things like that, that may have private crossing agreements with the railways for their crossings. Um, and the same thing goes for this one. So the grade crossing regulation and standards do cover existing private crossings. However, if your crossing again is accessed by the public, um, it, you know, it may be, be um, of, of due diligence to start thinking about the requirements for public crossings to your private crossing. Um, and then in the past, CTA decisions have granted private crossings to landowner under these types of conditions. So if there's no alternate access to the owner then other than crossing the tracks, a private crossing can be granted under, and that would involve an agreement between the railway and landowner for construction and maintenance. maintenance. Um, if there are no public roads bordering the land, so if you're landlocked, again, same thing, and the only way to cross to your the other half of your lands or the other portions of your lands is across the crossing, it could result in a private crossing. Um, I guess those two are kind of the same. And then uh, if a crossing is the only practical access, so maybe it's there's a creek and there's natural boundaries that don't allow you to access your lands, it must be across the railway. Uh, there have been decisions made that have allowed for private crossings for these reasons. And again, private quick requirements listed therein, which means that if a railway um, inspector did come out to do an inspection, they do have other enforcement tools other than a letter of concern. They do have orders they could issue as well as monetary penalties, which are also fines that could result. Okay, so now we'll get into the maintenance responsibilities. So just as an overview, when it comes to railway crossings, it should be remembered that there's always this spirit of shared responsibilities between railways and crossing owners, regardless if it's a public, private or farm crossing. Um, Transfer Canada and, and as well the CTA, they always sort of look for that symbiosis that a crossing is many stakeholders coming together. So there is always that shared responsibility. So I know when I worked at the railway a long time ago, there used to always be like, well, you know, the railway is fully responsible um, or vice versa, like the farm or agricultural land owner is responsible and everyone's trying to just separate that. But now with the new regulations, they're coming to officially show that, no, there is this shared responsibility between all parties. No party can be absolved or like, oh, you know, that's fully not my you know, um, 
responsibility. Everybody has to kind of share um, safety responsibilities when it comes to grade crossings. And then also the overall view of precedence is reflected through CTA decisions. So I know when it comes to private and farm crossings, there are very specific maybe history or specific site conditions that may affect how the regulations, the standards, the requirements are looked at for your crossing. Um, so when you do go to the CTA, they always do say to try it, they will probably reference a, a case that's that's similar to yours. Um, so, and again, it's that view of precedent. So not that everyone has time to read some of the decisions, but you could always reach out to the CTA, maybe give them a background of your situation and they may be able to help um, with some past decisions, clarify some of your um, responsibilities. And again, typically with a farm crossing, it's understood that all aspects of a crossing within the railway right of way are the responsibility of the railway. So that means anything within the railway's lands, which is the crossing surface, um, the surface extensions, we're gonna kind of get into that, but just to know that the difference between the farm and the private crossing, where a private crossing is now shared responsibility is kind of globally between um, the landowner and the, the railway in terms of sort of payment and, and doing the actions. And then the regulations and standards, one of the primary reasons for them rolling out is to more formalize the requirements and responsibilities at grade crossings. And generally speaking, the regulations talk about the need to share information amongst crossing owners as well as the maintenance and design requirements for the sight lines, the surface, the signage and signal requirements um, at public and private crossings. So it is uh, even through the Transport Canada regulations encouraged that a railway and a crossing owner share information on their crossing in terms of a design vehicle and speed. Um, and traffic. Um, there's a whole list through the regulations. We won't go through them, but um, that's a, the, the, one of the foundations of the regulations, um, as well as then you have the grade crossing standards that specifically outline um, the requirements for the four S's, we call them sightline, surface signage, and signals at, at crossings. And we're going to get into now each of those S's um, when it comes to farm and private crossings. So the first S for responsibilities is sight lines, um, which is tech, they really are the first line of defense at a grade crossing. Whether you can see an oncoming train um, is really one of the priorities for safety at crossings. Um, to determine the sight lines um, in the regulations and standards, it's sort of a calculation that's based on the design vehicle, design speed, um, as well as the train speed, um, and quite a few other aspects. And the importance to, is to know that sight lines must be maintained clear of obstruction. So you're always trying to make sure that you always do have that clear line of sight um, when you're approaching a crossing. And just to show something out of the regulation. So that legal requirement, again, that's for private and sort of public uh, crossings, primarily private for this presentation. And in the standards, it shows you these two different sight line triangles. So that first one at the top, the A is for crossings that have a standard railway crossing sign. That's the SRCS, which is the cross book shown there and stop sign. And the larger triangle at the bottom is for crossings that do not have a stop sign. They only have the standard railway crossing sign or the cross book. And the, the triangle at the bottom is larger because it's assuming that a crossing user will not be stopping before moving across the crossing. It's kind of like an approach. Upon the approach, upon the speed, you're gonna need a larger sightline triangle. And here's just a photo just to show or photos to compare the difference in the size of triangles between the cross buck and stop sign where you're at five meters from the nearest rail and you're looking down the track. It's all four quadrants. You can see that the, you see the track much more clearly and it's more just from that five meter mark, a smaller triangle. 
versus if you don't have the stop sign, which is fine. And it depends, you know, on the speed of your crossing, use your equipment, your farm equipment might not be going so fast. So your triangle might not be this large. This is for a public crossing, just to show the, the difference in the sight line triangle. But just to remember that now this, these triangles must always be clear of vegetation growth, um, even storage of materials. Um, sometimes fence lines can even become an obstruction. So it's just to keep in mind that when once these sight line distances are, are determined based on all these lovely design conditions, that these triangles must remain clear. And so the railway is responsible for clearing sight lines along their right of way. And a landowner would be responsible for the maintenance of the sight lines for anything that's on their property. Uh, a landowner is also responsible for assigning the design vehicle and roadway speed of their traveled way, so of the laneway. So if it's an agricultural laneway, um, because the sight lines are now calculated um, with a formula, um, landowners are encouraged to kind of guess what that speed would be, um, and or, or not guess, but like find the best, identify the best speed it should be, and then to also assign a design vehicle. So is it only pickup trucks that are going over your agricultural crossings, or are we having like large combines and, and trucks with that are hauling potentially other trailers? What's that design vehicle? What's that length? Because that will determine how large these triangles have to be. So those were the legal requirements. There's also sort of best practices when it comes to sight lines. Well, it's always not to obstruct them, um, but just to make sure that those triangles do stay clear of obstruction. Um, and then it just kind of explains how some things like physical installations, maybe material storage could obstruct sight lines, just to keep that in mind when you're building close to a crossing. Um, another thing is that to consider closure or cons or consolidation of crossings. If you just say you, you, you're, you have two farm crossings on the same property, or maybe your neighbor has a very close one that's close by, um, potentially there could be a safety gain there if you can consolidate, if you can come to agreement to, to do that, that would be beneficial to railway safety. And this is also very important if that's kind of the bottom photo. If your crossing is within a kind of curve where the sight line is now obstructed due to like a physical um, characteristic of the track, then this is showing a horizontal curve, but it could also be vertically due to approaches that you're not able to see. Um, closure or consolidation, or maybe even other ways around to your land might be a best or like a best practice for safety, because we're really just talking about railway safety. Um, and then that kind of leads into approving approach slopes or gradients. Um, and by doing that, so that's the thing I think from all the inspections I've done in Ontario and Quebec, when it comes to agricultural land crossings um, and private crossings, I've seen a common theme of really steep approaches, um, either like going down towards the tracks or coming up towards the tracks. and that can create challenges. So, you know, back to the previous slide where we said, okay, if you put a stop sign, you're trying your sight line triangle, it can be smaller. That's great if your approach gradients are flat. But if your approach gradients are now steep, and let's say going up towards the tracks, having a stop sign there might actually cause more trouble or issues because now you're getting a long and or heavy um, piece of equipment potentially to stop. And then to start going again to travel could extend the travel time. And then again, just increase that risk of being struck by a rail, by a, by a train. So again, every crossing is a snowflake. It's, it's things to consider. I definitely don't want everyone to start being like, oh, I'll just put a stop sign up at my crossing and it'll shrink my triangle. It does depend on sort of the equipment that's being used and whether it's practical for your crossing. If you have any questions like that, reach out any time to us or like, and I'll happy to kind of um, see what kind of crossing you have and what conditions um, should be considered. Um, another best practice is to always apply conservative crossing conditions um, when you're um, calculating 
sight lines, which means like when you're selecting your design vehicle and your design speed um, to kind of not pick the shortest vehicle and the fastest one, but to maybe find something in between just so that you know when you get that triangle um, calculation, that distance down, that it is something that's practical um, to, to your crossing users. Okay, the second S is um, surface. So in the regulations, again, for private, it's it's a bit up to, it's, it's, it's smooth and continuous, it says. It does have distances for sort of flangeways and spacings as well in the regulations, but generally speaking, there's, there's you know, a, a crossing surface is expected to be smooth and continuous. That is a photo of one that is not very smooth and continuous. Uh, but it can show you that there are most, you know, same when I do farm and, uh, farm and um, private crossing inspections, there are many that look like this because they are seasonal. They don't get the most maintenance. Um, so just to let you know, if you have a private crossing, depending on your agreement, you might be able to go to the railway and say, you know, the regulations require a smooth and continuous surface. Um, we need to do some, some maintenance here. So some things to consider. There's also a little excerpt there from the standards for new crossings, um, just to explain how there should be a crossing extension. So from the width of your traveled way, a minimum of half meter extension of the crossing surface should be present. Again, that's for um, kind of the crossing surface and things to consider. And I also posted there for new or modified crossings, crossings that might have significant change to them, that there are um, allowable approach gradients within certain distances from the nearest rail. And the percentages there, that's really just to say, again, they're trying to keep the approaches within 10 to 12 meters of a crossing pretty smooth and not so steep, again, to help with that sight line um, and that travel safely through a crossing um, type aspect. So that's the legal requirements. So when it comes to best practice set surfaces, it's good for landowners to consider the type of crossing service that's best for them. Um, you know, always it's always good to collaborate with the railway if they've put, for example, gravel down um, instead of timbers. I've seen that where a surface is just fully gravel and your you know your wheels are always spinning. Um, you do you know you do have sort of the right to talk to the railway if they are responsible for your surface to say you know I need something that's more smooth and continuous and safer um, and to consider other types of surfaces. Um, and another thing so in the bottom left photo it's showing kind of crossings a bit on a skew. So another thing to consider is the alignment of crossing surface. So the best um, and safest is just to have a perpendicular, just straight straight across the rail where you can. Um, so if there's a way to realign your laneways so that they, they also meet straight at the railway, that could um, support uh, railway safety there. Um, and then approach slopes again, you're going to hear that a lot. And then grade crossing visibility through delineation or even through vegetation clearing. So I know some approaches to agricultural crossings are full of like uh, vegetation or brush and you don't really know that you're at the crossing until you right come up to it. So just some other best practices to consider is to maybe clear some of that if you can, if it's not your crop and it's just, you know, extra vegetation to maybe cut it back so that you can see the crossing uh, clearly. And then we get into the third S, which is signage. So when it comes to farm and private crossings, unless the sign is there already. So if you do have a farm crossing that has that cross buck that were the standard railway crossing sign, then yes, the signage requirements would apply. Um, but if you don't, there is no requirement to start putting up signs. It's just that if you do decide to put some railway signage up, uh, that it must meet the, reg the standards and the regulations. And there's a list of some of the, you know, most of these might apply to more public crossings where you're putting, you know, speed advisory tabs and uh, railway crossing ahead signs. Um, but I think the two on the left there sort of shows you even the ministry has some private crossings and they've created signage to guard people away from using the crossings, um, as well as the railway also does have private crossing signs. I've seen many different types of landowners also that have created their own signs to keep people off of their crossings. And there's definitely nothing wrong um, with that, um, something to consider. 
the standards for those types of signs as well are a little bit referenced in the grade crossing handbook, um, which you know you have the grade crossing regulations and standards that must be read together. Even I get confused like when it comes to requirements because it's, re it's referencing, it's hard to, to read, but Transfer Canada has created a grade crossing handbook. The link will be provided um, at the end of the presentation and that handbook is the best. It really just, you know, you can go existing, private crossing, what do I need for signage? And it really writes it out practically um, what you need and what the expectations are. So that handbook is key. And uh, some best practices for signage is, yeah, to, so you can consider on your own lands to, you know, add on the approaches, some access restriction fo focus signage, right, right, like private use only, or, you know, uh, um, uh, beware, you know, crossing, uh, it's private, things like that to consider. Um, another thing is to, for um, farm and private crossings, is to use gates and locks where it's appropriate. So there's even, depending on the railway speed, um, if you are able to put a lock on it um, and kind of restrict access, um, it can change the way the re requirements are interpreted for your crossing. Again, it depends on the conditions fully of your crossing, but this is always a great um, sort of thing to do. It even helps the railway. If you have a seasonal railway or a seasonal crossing, and it's only used during like two months, but the rest of the months you have gates that are locked. It helps the railway understand too the usage um, at the crossing too. So it's a great way to keep people out and also communicates to the railway on your crossing use. Um, and then the final S is signals. So like for private and farm crossings, signals can be sort of rare depends so here there's a couple of photos here because it's triple track there definitely is due diligence where the railway has installed what they call a limited use warning system so it's not your typical public flashing lights bell and gate type system it's one that is unique to for farm and private crossings and it's really the railway that will install and maintain these. And then the landowner's responsibility is just to make sure that they remain visible so that there's not vegetation or um, materials or buildings or any installations that are blocking, blocking the lights. Um, this is very rare. I just put this prepare to stop because there may be some private crossings where upon the approach, there are these uh, sort of upon the approach prepare to stop at railway crossing, very rare, but this would be the responsibility of the person that owns the laneway. So just, but again, very rare for farm and private. And then again, the best practice uh, for signals is to use this limited use warning system where you have multiple tracks or where you have crossings with permanent instructions. Maybe you do have um, a building that's on your land that literally can't be moved out, but it's within that sightline triangle, something to consider to apply one of these sort of uh, systems. Um, and if you are considering signals to always consult with the railway, um, that's very important as they'll be the ones to do the design and install and everything. Okay, so that was the four S's. And then in addition to the four S's that are really clearly defined in Transport Canada's regulation and standards, there are also sort of responsibilities for other aspects that are not clearly defined in those, in those documents. Things like drainage, um, fencing, um, performing crossing assessments on safety yet to see what kind of improvements could uh, could be applied. Um, we talked a little bit about visibility and illumination, again, depending on your particular crossings uh, conditions, um, and also inventorying um, farm crossings and applying the regulations and standards as best practices to farm crossings. That's always something to consider. Um, and this kind of just separates some things to, to think about when it comes to drainage or fencing. Um, it's always seen that whatever's on your land, and I know when you get to the railway and, and a landowner, like the fence line, um, I guess that would have to be something to talk to the railway about. I, I definitely can't say like if the railway built it, they're gonna maintain it. Um, 
a lot of things happen over the years in terms of agreements and the railways used to have a lot more manpower back in the day where I know there was a lot of handshake agreements done in the field um, with landowners where the railway would maintain those things. But over time, the railways have lost a lot of their resources. They're working on ske with skeleton crews. And so you might have seen that the, the maintenance of fencing um, between your lands has gone down. And it, it's not that it's not right to turn to the railway to do the maintenance. It's just that maybe they were doing it uh, in the past based on these handshake agreements, whereas now um, things are changing. So uh, again, the CTA always encourages that discussion and collaboration where you can. Um, and then there's also the bridges and culverts. So there might be culvert uh, cattle passes, things like this for bridges and maybe even culverts under the railway. Um, there are the Transfer Canada guidelines for safety management of business of bridges and culverts that can be referenced uh, if you're looking to really understand who's responsible for what. Um, and again, you can always reference uh, to the CTA or to Transfer Canada to um, clarify some of the requirements if you need. Uh, this is a chart. We won't really go straight through it. Through it, it's more because I know you're going to get this presentation at the end, and it. It's supposed to take those four S's of the regulation and let you know who, who's responsible and the compliance timeline, because I'm sure many of you have heard of the November 28, 2021, where the requirements in the regulations or some of the requirements of the regulations will now be in, in force. Um, you'll notice in here in brackets, I've, write, I've, wrote, I've written the deadline and then or risk-based planning. So Transport Canada has been great and has sort of went to the stakeholders to ask how they're doing and consult on is this deadline feasible. And there has been some consultation and there's information on that consultation on your website. I know the OFA was part of it. You can see the comments publicly on Transport Canada's websites from, from the OFA. So there is a consideration of a, a risk-based planning, risk planning approach to crossing compliance. And I think the key for crossing owners to know is that Transport Canada has a great crossing inventory and the link will also be provided that lists all of the crossings that they have in their inventory. Um, so that includes some farm. It's not all farm crossings, but your farm crossing may be on this list. And it's ranked in terms of safety. So Transport Canada and the University of Waterloo and through research, they have created this risk-based um, ranking system uh, based on sort of incidents at crossings and every crossing there is ranked. So that can kind of help you also, if your crossing is on that list, you can see how it's ranked in all of Canada to, in terms of safety. And so when it comes to compliance, they'll be looking at the sort of higher ranked priority ones and then kind of going down. And that's where the deadline can maybe sort of slow release itself based on priority. So just something to consider. Okay, and then rail developments and crossing changes. So Ontario is undergoing a lot of rail development. And as a result, there are many provincial, municipal, local laws and requirements that are being rolled out. So you can even see there's an act, the Building Transit Fact, Faster Act in Ontario. Um, so I'm, I'm, we're not gonna go through all of this stuff, but just to let you know, some of these things are coming out to municipally and provincially. Um, it might be, if you do have a rail crossing that maybe be affected by some of these projects, definitely get to check out what is applicable to you. And, and once you kind of find that out, there are resources out there. So the Federation of Canadian Municip Municipalities and the Railway Association of Canada have developed, these guidelines have been out for a while in terms of development and proximity to the railway. It's more primarily focused on public, but you can still maybe use some of the information as a best practice. It talks about berms and setbacks and things like that. So these are some resources that you can definitely reference. And then um, when it comes to rail developments and crossing changes. So overall, when there is a change in suggested that affects a crossing. The CTA's kind of precedence in, in files is that they look at the initiator first. 
So whoever needs the change, like if the railway is coming and saying, I need a, another track here, they would be the initiator and they would be seen as kind of more the primary responsible, which makes sense, right? If you're not, if you don't need another track, it's kind of more of a, the initiators lead to be, to be responsible for costs and maintenance when you get to those negotiations. But again, just to remember that spirit of shared responsibility, so you can't be like, well, they just need to track it. I have nothing to do with it. Uh, there is still that shared responsibility where, okay, if they need their track, that means we might have to put signals in, which means both of both, like all stakeholders that are crossing um, are responsible. And in sort of the past that I know of, the decisions I've seen like a minimum of at least 15% responsibility um, when it comes to changes at a crossing for, for construction and maintenance costs. So it could be something to consider. But again, every case is different. It's just uh, sharing some information now. And then if there are changes to an existing private crossing, they do have to now be brought up to the regulations. And so that's why, again, we always talk about best practices for farm crossings or private crossings to refer to the regulations and standards um, and meet them where you can if it if it's not too, you know, if it's not too much trouble. Um, and then that's just saying again. I'm not talking for every change and every real development. It's just to really understand that the initiator of change really is seen as the lead when it comes to cost. But again, everyone is responsible. So just something to consider. And then grant funding. So Transport Canada has the Railway Safety Improvement Program. And these are just some snapshots from the, the website. The link will be given to you. And you can see that they are still accepting applications for the 2022-2023 um, kind of fiscal year. And what you do is you apply online. You have to give a background of your project. So maybe you are considering consolidating with a, a neighboring uh, farm or agricultural crossing. And maybe, or maybe you want to, from, there's a nearby public um, road and you want to build a road on your lands so that you can close your crossing for, and you can access from the public road without crossing. Um, this uh, grant funding could be an option for you and your application must be submitted before you start any of the work. And there's even incentives for closure. So if you're looking to close your crossing, you can apply for up to $6,000 for the closure of a crossing. And the financial support that this program provides is up to 80% for landowner costs. So if you were going to do that, build a road from a main road to eliminate your crossing, um, it won't pay for the purchase of land, but for the construction costs, up to 80% can be provided for up to 10 million per fiscal year. And if there's any railway costs, and maybe you're even thinking about installing signals, um, again, collaborate with the railway, but the RCIP program can be an application that you both go to to share the costs and the railway would get 50% of their costs um, back. And just to give you an example for this year, Transport Canada issued $21 million to fund 135 projects. So um, definitely apply. There's definitely um, money there. Um, and that's just reiterating the application deadline. And the, the website's there to be referenced. It will also be provided to you. And then again, this presentation will have all these links for you. Uh, the OFA will provide it to you after uh, the completion of this. And yeah, we can take questions. Sorry, I talked long enough. Thank you so much, Lillian. That was really informative and very excellent. And I know that uh, some on our call from the staff, from the member service team, helped me to come up with our wish list of topics that we sent to you. And I think you did an excellent job of covering what we asked you to cover. So thanks again. Um, any questions for Lillian in the chat? If you do have questions, if you wanna enter those now, uh, that would be great. If not, I do have one question that did come in to me by email ahead of the webinar. So I will go ahead and put that into the chat now. And that way, if it might give everybody else a chance to think about what their question might be. So the question I have is, 
would it be possible or feasible and cost effective to alert operators of agricultural equipment and vehicles of oncoming trains by using proven GPS system with transmitters on locomotives and receivers on portable Garmin-like devices? Um, so that would give them a little bit of notice when the train is coming. Um, do you think that would be something that would be possible with backup systems or track circuits and line of sight transmitter? Yeah, this is definitely an innovation that even when I was at transport, we went to like grade crossing conferences and there were some technologies, I think even Google, like uh, maps or, or even if it's wave, the sort of GPS directional uh, programs will alert you approaching railway crossing. So this, uh, you know, a program like that, I know there are people looking into it. Right now, there's nothing in the regulations or anything that forces a railway to have these transmitters talking to public information. And I think maybe that might slow it down a bit, the security of what's on a train consist and knowing where it is and and, you know, at all times kind of thing. So it's definitely not something that has, that's unheard of. Um, and there are some technologies out there, but um, yes, very like interesting way to alert um, crossing users. Um, but for now, really the way to alert crossing users through the regulations is through those four S's, which is the signage surface signals, just the traditional way right now. Okay, perfect. I'm not seeing another question popping into our chat here. Uh, maybe we'll just give a few more minutes uh, for people to think about um, any questions that they may have. And I'll just reiterate again that if you do think of something after the meeting, I'm gonna put my email address into the chat. Many of you have it already, or you could contact your member service rep and send the questions that way. But if a question does come up after the meeting, I know we've processed a lot of information here and we will have the links that Lillian was kind enough to supply to us. So if a question comes up in the aftermath, um, you can send those through to us by email as well and we'll see if we can get them answered. So just give a few more minutes here. Okay. Um, we've got a question from Steve coming in. Uh, the question was if the grants are available for next year for the 2022 uh, 23 year, I believe you mentioned and too late for this year, is that accurate? Yeah, the way the RCIP um, works is that it's like a preemptive thing. So you apply now for next year. And yeah, I do see deadline is November, 2021. Um, so if you haven't started any work there, um, Steve, I would still put it in application. Um, but if you have started work, unfortunately, that won't be covered by the grant, but uh, anything else you have outstanding will be. And again, they are considering or there is that consultation on this sort of softer deadline coming through. That could work to your advantage. So definitely apply. Yes, for sure. And uh, OK, a question from Kristen here. Would a wider crossing to accommodate larger equipment be the responsibility of the landowner or the railway and how to go about it? That's a great, and I'm sure a common question. You might only, yes, have like a nine foot crossing, but you're looking for a 23, like a double one. So it depends on your crossing agreement. If you think you have a farm crossing where there's no written agreement and it's your statutory right, that kind of 103 cross, crossing, then I would definitely contact the railway and just start that collaboration through them. Um, like, yeah, depending on maintenance costs, like if you've never paid a dollar for maintenance at your crossing, um, it might be something the railway, they could come and say, well, you know, this crossing was originally built as a single, and now you're looking for a wider, can we cost share? So you might have some negotiations that way, um, but they would be the ones to install the surface and you would definitely need to, to uh, let them know. So I would definitely, um, contact the railway. If you need a contact to the railway, you can try to send me a note after and I can see if, if I can connect you. Um, but it's, it, it's definitely, I guess it depends on the agreement and it would be, you would put the landowner would, would potentially have like cost sharing to install it since it was originally just the one, one width. Okay. And I've got a question coming in from Barclay. If a rail company repairs a tunnel under a set of tracks, 
but that repair makes it smaller so that it can't be used for some farm practices. If the landowner approaches the rail company for a new or renewed overland crossing, should the landowner expect to take on most of the construction mm -hmm. costs? That is definitely a question for the CTA. <laughs> It seems like there's a quite a unique situation that's going over there. So when I worked at the railway, it, we did kind of look at, okay, what was originally constructed? And we always talk about restoration, that things, if they're going to be changed, should be as they were or better, right? Never less. So it sounds like, Berkeley, you might be dealing with a different kind of change. And again, I don't know the agreements and the specifics of that tunnel, um, but um, I would def that's you know, if you have some more information and you want to reach out to the CTA, they might be able to help um, in your specific case. Um, and same thing, um, if you haven't spoken to the railway yet, to maybe start that conversation with them, um, you know, there is, again, that collaboration, so they should be getting back, back to you. Okay, and thank you. And another question from Steve, the deadline is potentially a soft deadline. I wonder if you could just go back through that risk-based Sure. Analysis that you talked about. No problem. So um, again, the Transport Canada did perform a consultation earlier this year. Um, it, nothing's been official yet, but they are considering a softer deadline as many stakeholders are still in the in the process of making those improvements. So more to come on that uh, from Transport Canada as it comes out. I'm just going to see if I can find a link to our submission on that and put it in, in the chat as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll read this other question then while you do that. Um, okay, thanks. One from Deb, and she's asking, my experience with member issues is very challenging to speak with a real person at the railway. Yes, 100%. What is the best avenue to get in touch with them if a member is having an issue? Very difficult to get a call back or return to email. I'm sure many of you share this. And I remember being at the railway and, and even now in the industry, knowing that this is this is a challenge that continues um, in industry. When it comes to crossings, I, I know for CNNCP, it's their public works groups that are the ones responsible for this collaboration. So you may have had the contact for the local um, track supervisor um, or, or maintainer, and maybe they stopped um, um, being in contact with you, again, because a lot of them have now, are now skeleton crews. So I would definitely try to get a hold of the railways public works department, and that's where you should be able to get a response. And again, if you don't, I'm not, trying to encourage you to go to the CTA or if it's a or if it's a real safety concern you could potentially um, reach out to Transfer Canada if it is a safety concern but if it's really just a ownership or maintenance thing try to get a hold of those um, public works departments uh, and Deb you can email me after um, if you if it is a CNNCP I can share you with the latest contact that I have um, and hopefully they'll get back to you on on your issue. Okay, I thank everybody that I am going to cap the questions there. I want to be mindful of time and we are just about at the limit of our hour here. But as I mentioned earlier, if you do have any additional questions, uh, feel free to send them to me through your MSR or directly and we will get a list compiled for Lillian and we will see if we can get some of those answers. And thank you so much to Lillian for being here today and for putting so much work into this very helpful informative webinar for us today. It was very much appreciated and we will have a great resource going forward for our membership. So thank you, Lillian. Yes, thank you everybody for attending and feel free to reach out however, however you need. Awesome. Wonderful. Well, that wraps up our webinar today. So thanks again, everybody. And we will leave the call shortly. Bye-bye.